your grass green? Maybe it's time you got a fertilizer that works at every level. Introducing Bear Advance Triple Action Lawn Fertilizer. It works at every level. The grass, the roots, plus it fortifies the soil for a thicker, deep down green that lasts, guaranteed. Bear Advanced, better thinking, better results. Prevent crabgrass while you feed. Try Triple Action Lawn Fertilizer plus Crabgrass Preventer. Tomorrow. Day by day, Saddam Hussein is losing his grip on Iraq. As Allied forces close in on Baghdad, will Saddam use deadly chemical weapons as a last-ditch defense? And could his own elite guard turn on him? Tomorrow, for the latest coverage on Iraq, stay with Fox News Channel's primetime lineup. Tomorrow, from the military war chest to the price of humanitarian aid, what is the bottom line for taxpayers and the economy? Answers from Senator Don Nichols on Your World with Neil Cavuto. Hello, everybody. I'm Donna Fiducia, and here's the latest on Operation Iraqi Freedom. Coalition forces opening a new front in northern Iraq. A thousand paratroopers touched down inside Kurdish-controlled territories in northern Iraq and seized an airstrip there. Tanks and other supplies will be airlifted behind them. Meanwhile, an explosion in a Baghdad marketplace kills over a dozen civilians. There is some question now over the source of that blast. Iraq says the explosion was caused by a coalition missile, but Central Command disagrees and says it may have been a misfired Iraqi warhead. And Iraqi troops are on the move. Central Command says Republican Guard units are repositioning. They're moving south, apparently getting ready for battle. Those elite guard units appear headed for the Iraqi town of Nujaf. And that's where U.S. troops fought a tough battle with Iraqi forces today. A U.S. military officer says the Iraqis destroyed a number of tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles with rocket-propelled grenades. The first big batch of humanitarian relief also arriving in southern Iraq today in the middle of a huge sandstorm. Iraqis lining up as British troops handed out meal packets and bottles of water. And British Prime Minister Tony Blair arrived in Washington tonight and made his way to Camp David for a meeting with President Bush. The two leaders will discuss progress and what to do with a post-war Iraq. And those are your latest headlines in Operation Iraqi Freedom. I'm Donna Fiducia. So the paratroopers are in, in northern Iraq, the 173rd Airborne Brigade there. My apologies. Here with more on the latest in Operation Iraqi Freedom, our national security correspondent, Brett Fair, live at the Pentagon. Hello again, Brett. Hey, Shep. Yeah, that northern front is now developing. Uh, 1,000 paratroopers from the 173rd out of Vicenza, Italy, now dropping into northern Iraq, securing an airfield there. Uh, they're doing what's called a jump and carry operation right now, essentially just carrying what they have with them. And then uh, soon they'll bring in heavy vehicles, Bradley fighting vehicles. They've secured an airfield, and we assume uh, and have been told that a number of other troops will be funneling into the north in addition to what we've seen already, which is the special forces units that have been training and working with the Kurdish rebels there. Hey, Brett, we were talking earlier about this cover of the... Uh the WashingtonPost.com, senior U.S. military officials telling uh, Tom Ricks, the reporter for the Washington Post, this could take months, citing a combination of wretched weather, long and insecure supply lines, and an enemy that has refused to supine in the face of American combat power has led to a broad reassessment by some top generals in the U.S. military. Some top generals. What do you know about all this? Well, I think it's a bit overstated. I have a lot of respect for Tom Rex as a reporter. I think he has a lot of good sources in this building, but if you asked me before this conflict started, I could have told you that about six or seven days into it, uh, we'd be seeing a story like this on the front page of the Washington Post. Hmm. Interesting. You know, th I, I wanted to go through some of these things. Uh, I have not been given reports to indicate that the supply lines are shaky. In fact, I've been given reports to the contrary, that in fact the supply lines are coming around these cities where these guerrillas, where these terrorists are fighting. Right, and, and they're saying that they're doing some things to augment the supply and communication lines. They do stretch some 300 miles. 
Um, there will be eventually, in about two weeks, we're told, another entire division, the 4th Infantry Division. Uh, the 35 cargo ships that were off the coast of Turkey are now coming through the Suez Canal to Kuwait. Uh, the troops in Fort Hood, Texas, will be flown out. There are a number of, there are two other divisions that will be put in. This was part of the plan, the follow-on forces. This is not uh, the reaction of General Franks to something that's going on right now. Now, has everything gone rosy? Has everything gone uh, great? No. These Fedayeen uh, troops uh, have been harassing uh, some of the, the rear guard movements. Uh, they've, they've had to deal with this. The U.S. and coalition forces have. Uh, but if the plan was to get up to Baghdad, encircle it, and then take it on their own time frame, uh, Pentagon officials say that's where we are and we're on track. Uh, we've actually gone faster than anyone expected us to. Is, the, is there a sense there that a, a lot of this, this thing is going too slowly, this thing is off plan, is sort of a like a like a swirling tornado that happens in the front of big buildings in New York we just starts becoming part of itself and then truth be damned it just begins to swirl well I look back to Afghanistan and the first days of Afghanistan you know we in this this very room uh, some of the questions I would say most of the questions had to do with how the US was bogged down how this was a quagmire we heard that word many times and uh, Secretary Rumsfeld continued to say that it is going to pan out. And the next day, Masri Sharif fell, uh, and then the whole thing came tumbling down. I'm not saying it's going to be like that. It is not the optimistic way, but I, I would just tell you that Pentagon officials say this is the plan. It was expected, and uh, these questions were expected as well. All of that said, Brett, um, is it fair to say that regarding the, the operations of these terrorists, particularly on the two bridges in An or and, and down in the south in Basra, that, that maybe they didn't have the sense that these terrorists would be fighting so hard, but that they had folks in place to deal with them, should they? I talked to General Pete Pace, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, in the hallway tonight. He said he has been surprised by uh, how uh, dirty the fighting has become this early. Uh, he has been surprised by some of the harassment attacks on supply lines and communication lines. Uh, he said that it is being dealt with. They are being dealt with, meaning these Fedayeen Saddam troops that have been doing this. Uh, he says overall, though, the plan is on track. We're not calling in a ton of other forces because we're in trouble. Uh, he said that we're going to move forward, and in coming days, probably tomorrow, we're going to be seeing some of the heaviest battles with some of the biggest Iraqi Republican Guard divisions, the Medina and Hammurabi in particular, that have been pounded from the air for the last day and a half. Uh, there was a report uh, on the ground that a column of vehicles was coming south out of Baghdad. Central Command described it as a repositioning. But either way, they said anytime these guys move in their vehicles, we pluck them out. We, we pound away at them. We want to see them move. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what develops in the next day. I guess if you're the only one with an Air Force in the mix here, a column might be a fun target. I mean, yeah, if one aircraft, uh, Rocky aircraft, not one, has managed to get up. Brett Baer with it all for us from the Pentagon. Brett, good to see you again. Thank you. Sure. Rockies in the South getting much needed food and water donated by the Kuwaiti government. Jonathan Hunt's live in Kuwait City with more on the details of that. Jonathan? Hey, Shep, we are, after all, just one week into this war, and already the huge humanitarian aid effort promised by President Bush is beginning to get underway. There were a couple of delays. Iraqi resistance, first of all, in some parts of the south, that's been dealt with. The inclement weather that uh, blew through here over the last 48 hours, that is now passing, and the convoys are rolling. One of the first of them reached the town of Safwan. That's just across the border from Kuwait. It was greeted by hundreds of Iraqis, clearly desperate for the food that convoy was carrying. It led to some chaotic but essentially joyful scenes as the boxes containing food were handed out. 21,000 meals in all bread, flour, tea and water. Now another convoy also rolled into the port city of Umm Qasr. There are various ships as well waiting off of that port carrying tons more aid. They are 
simply waiting to dock. British troops say that Umm Qasr itself is now open, it is safe and therefore all of that aid will begin to come in now that the Iraqi resistance there has been put down and once, once that aid begins to arrive it can start moving further north to cities like Basra. First though of course Basra itself has to be secured and the battle is still raging in Basra. The British troops who've encircled the city are fighting Iraqi regular soldiers but also the 1,000 militia, the Fedayeen that you just heard Brett Baer talking about. That fighting has been fierce. It has caused some civilians in Basra to begin leaving the city. Presumably they fear for their own safety but also they may simply be trying to head south out of the city towards those aid convoys which are now rolling. Meantime coalition planes taking off from their bases here in Kuwait are pounding a column of around 120 Iraqi tanks and armoured vehicles which has left Basra apparently using the sandstorm as cover. Now there is a question over their motive. Are they simply trying to get away from the British troops there or are they heading further south to attack other coalition forces? Either way, the air raids which are now underway should prevent them achieving either of those goals, Shep. Jonathan Hunt, live for us. Jonathan, thank you. Coming up, the United Nations World Food Program saying Iraq will probably need the biggest humanitarian operation in history. That just to feed the hungry Iraqis. We'll talk about the work to do after all this is over. And pictures from the front line tonight. A soldier securing the area as the battalion makes a rest stop in the desert on the way to Baghdad. The battle of Baghdad is to come. And you can count on Fox News for fair and balanced coverage. macaroni grill. You can choose from four different pastas, eight sauces, and delicious extras to create your own unique dish, all from only $7.99. Create your own pasta from Romano's Macaroni Grill, making life delicious. And now by the authority festival. So young, naive. I bet they don't have a clue. Or that insurance. What insurance? The one that pays you cash if you're sick and can't work. What one's that? Editor of the Weekly Standard and Fox News political analyst, Bill, good to see you. Hi, Chef. How are you? They say it's not a war council. It's a war council, isn't it? Bill, come on. It's a war council. It's a war council. I think Tony Blair will want to talk a little bit about what happens after the war, too, but I think it's a war council. Is maybe, they'll, maybe they'll discuss the Washington Post front page piece that you've just discussed with Brett Baer by Tom Ricks. Can I just say a word about that? Would you because please? I, I know Tom Ricks, and uh, I like him. He's written once or twice for the Weekly Standard, the magazine I edit. Uh, experienced war correspondent. But he has an agenda. He has a point of view. If this piece on the front page of the Washington Post tomorrow runs as a news piece and not as a news analysis piece, in my opinion, it's a disgrace. And it really should be an op-ed. Un unnamed senior, alleged senior officials quoted, senior officers uh, quoted, saying, gee, this could take months. We have no idea whether this is four senior officers out of, you know, what, 20,000 senior officers in the Pentagon who believe this. The people who were quoted by name mostly deny that it will take months. Uh, one man, a uh, uh, retired planner who's been a skeptic about this war and uh, frankly against this war from the beginning, is quoted saying, gee, it looks as if it's going very badly. Um, this is not, you know, this is not, I think, a piece that one can take as straight news reporting. And I don't say that, you know, Tom Ricks is entitled to lay out the argument that this could take months. But that's a point of view. That is not news reporting. It's hard to argue. Would it not be hard to argue, though, Bill, 
that this could not take months. It's possible, I mean, in, in this circumstance that everybody's been quite plain to say, we don't really know how long this is gonna take. It's gonna take until we're finished. Absolutely, I mean, it could take two weeks, it could take four or five weeks. I'd say that's kind of the average. If you ask intelligent people around town, it's probably about a month, and it would have been a month a week ago before the war began, incidentally. And to, to put on the front page, I guess the lead article looks like in the Washington Post, a headline, war could last months, officers say. And this is unsourced, some officers in the Pentagon. The first quote in the piece, in the third paragraph is, tell me how this ends, one senior officer said yesterday. So you find one senior officer who's sort of unhappy with it, with the war plan, tell me how this ends. That's a Washington Post news piece. Tom Ricks does not like Don Rumsfeld. Uh, he thinks Rumsfeld's been a bad defense secretary. That's a legitimate point of view. A lot of people who experienced uh, deal with a lot, a lot of the military. Rumsfeld's broken a lot of China at the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And if you're a guy who likes some of the people who own the China that Rumsfeld's broken, you're going to be unhappy with Rumsfeld, and you're going to be happy to write a piece that uh, casts doubt on his war planning. But again, I, I'm really struck by how thin a piece this is. And, and I respect Tom Ricks, and I respect the Washington Post. But to run this as the lead news story of the day, if that's what it is tomorrow in tomorrow morning's Post, I think really comes close to being disgraceful. Mm -hmm. What about this meeting between the president and the prime minister? Is it possible that the prime minister is the one saying, let's, let's not put up this iron fence here, let's, let's keep this as, e as clean as we can, that President Bush might have another idea? What do you mean by the iron fence? You mean the... By that I mean when the British troops are in the south saying, we, these people are shooting at us from homes, but there are women and children there, so we can't shoot back. We ought to be able to defend ourselves. They've done this to themselves. That could be. I mean, look, we've gone out of our way. I'm not sure there's a difference between the Americans and the British on this. Both of us have gone out of our way to avoid civilian casualties. We probably, we have bent over backwards, clearly. Um, uh, we may, we may bend, stop bending over quite as far backwards here. I think the British have fought awfully well, my sense is, and uh, they are on the verge, I think, of liberating Basra, which will be a very big deal. Um, in my sense is Blair's in good shape at home. The British are proud of the way their troops are fighting and are proud of the mission. Uh, Blair wants to maintain good relations with the Europeans. The one thing he's going to try to do here is act as a sort of bridge between Bush, uh, between the Americans and the Europeans. Uh, I think that's doable, at least in the short term. Um, I think this will be a pretty successful brief meeting between Bush and Blair. Bill Crystal from the Weekly Standard, Fox News contributor. Bill, good to see you. Thanks. Thanks, Chef. All right. Coming up, U.S. troops parachuting into northern Iraq, opening up a new front in Operation Iraqi Freedom. The northern front that they'd hoped to have from the very beginning, but didn't because the Turks never allowed it. Well, now it's parachuting in. Chris Klein is in northern Iraq with more on that. Reporting from northern Iraq, this is Chris Klein. After nearly a week of intensive Allied aerial bombardment over the northern Iraqi cities of Kirkuk and Mosul, the ground effort in northern Iraq by coalition forces seems to have been strengthened considerably and begun in earnest. Only a few hours ago, some 1,000 paratroopers from the 173rd U.S. Airborne Brigade, based in Vicenza, Italy, made a parachute drop near the southern city of Suleimania. Uh, this city being one of the two regional capitals of the liberated Iraqi Kurdish zone. To the best of our knowledge, the 1,000 paratroopers have now secured a perimeter around a vital airfield on the outskirts of Suleimania, and uh, the expectation is that that airfield will see more Allied airborne forces arrive, and if that isn't the case, at the very least, that airfield will serve as an important logistics bridgehead that will serve the efforts of a new northern front opening here in Iraqi Kurdistan. The 1,000 Allied paratroopers are also perhaps expected to join in the fight with local Kurdish forces against the Islamic extremists of Ansar al-Islam, a radical terrorist group uh, located near the border in Iraqi Kurdistan with Iran, occupying a stronghold enclave of several square kilometers. Now, despite uh, heavy Allied air bombardment of that region, as well as severe missile attacks and ground efforts by local Kurdish forces backed by small teams of Western Special Forces, despite heavy casualties imposed on the Ansar al-Islam group, several hundred of the radical uh, Muslim fighters remained there, uh, holding out defiantly and tenaciously against uh, the onslaught of both Kurdish and Western forces. 
the arrival of the 1,000 Allied paratroopers will perhaps help significantly in the effort to deal a fatal blow against the Ansar terrorists. The paratroopers, however, will also likely fulfill a role in uh, a diversionary role in uh, preventing uh, Iraqi forces from being moved further south uh, simply by their sheer presence. Uh, the paratroopers will also likely serve yet another function in closing off that region of Iraqi Kurdistan as an escape route to uh, escaping Allied, for, uh, rather escaping Iraqi forces. Meanwhile, uh, overnight, uh, Allied air operations continued over the cities of Mosul and Kirkuk, as before, still targeting uh, Western squadrons, still targeting uh, Iraqi air defenses, command and control facilities, radar installations, and heavy Iraqi ground formations. A new development, however, in the course of the last day is that Kurdish forces believe they've identified uh, a battery of perhaps 12 to 20 short-range surface-to-surface Iraqi uh, ballistic missiles, which pose a threat to the larger population centers uh, in northern Iraq, and all the more so if those missiles are armed with uh, biological or chemical warheads. Uh, so indeed, one believes that uh, Allied air efforts uh, overnight were also directed at those missile batteries. And the combination of Allied air uh, operations and a new presence on the ground by conventional uh, Western light forces signals a new chapter is opening in the Allied northern front in Iraqi Kurdistan. Reporting from Iraqi Kurdistan, Chris Klein, Fox News. Chris, thank you. Humanitarian issues beginning to grab more headlines. Work continues on the effort to get relief columns into Iraq. And the U.S. Uh, the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan is voicing concern about civilian deaths, calling on the combatants to protect civilians. It's now Mark Ginsburg, former ambassador to Morocco and Fox News Foreign Affairs analyst. Mark, good to see you. Hi, Shepard. Good evening. What do you make of these statements? Of, uh, who, who is obliged to protect them? Is it the allies or is it Saddam Hussein? Well, there's a certain amount of truth in both statements, Shep. What clearly is going on here is that by the infiltration of Fedayeen and irregular forces into towns like Al Nasiriya and Basra, as well as Umm Qasar, uh, clearly here, Saddam has tried to use civilians as ways to prevent allies from capturing and liberating these towns. And indeed, with guns to their backs, with potential rebellions taking place, Saddam has starved those people. He cut off food and water supplies to Basra weeks ago. So clearly, when Americans and British troops tried to enter these towns, these people are very upset and very uh, unhappy over the fact that many of them have been uh, uh, without water and without food. And with the food supplies uh, quite low and with the early arrival of these shipments, perhaps the situation will change. But, you know, we're doing everything we can to protect civilian casualties, but Arab television, Shep, is doing an enormous amount of damage to our reputation by, by portraying us as intentionally uh, targeting civilians. One of two things happened today, Ambassador, e or yesterday, I guess, Iraqi time. Either one of our bombs or missiles uh, went astray and accidentally hit a civilian area, or, they or the Iraqis caused that damage themselves. Either way, neither is being reported. In, in many of the Arab countries, what you're hearing is that the United States and coalition forces are now targeting the Iraqi people. No matter what we say about that, that's the message. It's a powerful message. How destructive can it be? Well, it, it can be destructive only to a certain extent because Arab attitudes were already inflamed, and clearly as the situation in the, in, in, in our, in the conflict escalates and the siege of Baghdad perhaps commences, there are going to be inevitable civilian casualties. But we have to keep drumming the same message, Shep, that when you think about the hundreds of thousands of innocent Iraqis who have died at the hands of Saddam, the number of casualties that have been unintentionally targeted here as a result either because of installations that Saddam has used to hide in civilian neighborhoods or because of an inadvertent targeting by U.S. and coalition weaponry. The fact remains is we're engaged in a massive battle for the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people, and we know that the enemy on the other side perhaps is Arab media. Indeed. All right, Ambassador Mark Ginsburg. Ambassador, thank you very much. Those are some of the latest pictures. We'll get you those in just a moment. But first, I want to show you a photo we've just gotten uh, from the White House pool. Uh, this is from the sitting room, clearly, at Camp David. And 
President Bush and Prime Minister Blair are sitting around the coffee table discussing, among other things, the war in Iraq, in Iraq, its progress, humanitarian aid, and what's necessary, uh, both of those and much more on the President and the Prime Minister's agenda as they uh, kick back at at Camp David this week, uh, for, the, for the night at least, and tomorrow the Prime Minister will meet with Kofi Annan. Don't want to make it sound uh, too casual a thing. You know, president after president has commented about what a great place Camp David is to clear your head and allow yourself to focus on the important issues of the day. Uh, there's a famous story that I believe has been told here very recently uh, about President Clinton and the fact that, that initially he didn't, he didn't subscribe to that notion, but uh, after a very rough year or two, uh, began to do just that. A great place for any president to focus and certainly a good place for a meeting uh, this night as we approach midnight at Camp David. Iraqi resistance in Nasiriya giving coalition forces a fight. Ross Appleyard of our sister network Sky News in the UK with more now from the front lines. British soldiers on the front line have been helping American Marines secure the town of Nazaria. Their heavy armor supplements the huge American batteries that have fired shell after shell into Iraqi lines. The firepower has resulted in the capture of hundreds of prisoners of war. But all is not as it seems. Some POWs have appeared to give themselves up, only to turn round at the last minute and attack convoys with machine guns. Despite that, though, prisoners are given shelter, food and water. Their injuries treated by medics like British-born Ken George of the US Marines. When they come through our lines, we'll pat them down, make sure that uh, they're not armed, they don't pose a threat to us, and if they've got injuries, we're going to treat them. Around the bridges of Nazaria, dirty tactics have been employed. Women and children are forced to the front line as Iraqi soldiers fire on the convoys from behind them. I have Marines uh, up with my battalion up, at the, up on the front that are uh, no more than uh, three kilometers from here that uh, have positively identified that tactic. The guerrilla tactics have resulted in a small number of coalition casualties but have also slowed up the advance towards Baghdad. These supply trucks waiting to head north have been delayed because the road ahead is simply still too dangerous. The heavy armor up in front needs its logistical support if the final aim of securing Baghdad is to be achieved. The Marines have been engaged in a major firefight just north of Nazaria at Ashatra. The town is another important tactical bound on the road to Baghdad. Ross Appleyard, Sky News, Iraq. And there's much more to come as Fox reports tonight. The fog of war now seems to be settling in around the press corps. Talk in the corridors of the Pentagon and in the newspapers that the war is not moving quickly enough that we could be bogged down for months. Tonight, what the brass are saying about being ahead of the game and the chess moves being made now. The blitz of Baghdad parachuting in the north, locking horns with Republican Guard tank columns in two minutes' time. We are ready for anything that lies ahead in Operation Iraqi Freedom. I'll be back then as Fox News Channel coverage continues. Thanks for trusting us for your news and information. Well, there was one year where I, I almost lost the entire backyard to crabgrass, and I vowed that would never happen again. The following year, I did use Turf Builder plus halts. It not only got rid of the crabgrass, but it also greened up the lawn and thickened it. I used the cheaper brands, but I didn't have the color that I wanted, and I did have the weeds. Look how thick it is. Look at the color of it. There are no weeds. I take the credit instead of Scott's. I call it Luby Lawn. I'm very proud of the results that I get from Scott's. And there will be no crabgrass. Stay with Fox News Channel for the latest the war coverage. forces have shot down. First in the morning. You are looking right now. A thorough right. look at the events from overnight. First yeah, throughout the day. Live reports with purpose. Keeping you informed, fair, and balanced. The most powerful prime time in cable news. Real insight and analysis. The Fox way. Fox News Channel. Eyes around the world. A commitment here at home. The first place to turn for the latest in news. Fox News Channel. Real journalism. Fair and balanced. Northern Front on the road to Baghdad.
Baghdad is now open. A thousand GIs dropping safely into northern Iraq today after coalition bombing runs on enemy positions. The paratroopers joining special forces already on the ground. More than 30 explosions heard in and around Baghdad tonight, almost exactly one week after the bombing began. Smoke seen coming from several buildings in the center of the city. The sound of planes and anti-aircraft fire heard all around. Saddam's Republican Guard units repositioning themselves south of Baghdad despite a report from other network uh, embedded reporters saying that a column was headed south. The Pentagon now says repositioning. Many coming to join the fight from the south, getting picked off by Allied aircraft. And the Pentagon sending more than 30,000 reinforcements to the Gulf, including the 4th Infantry Division. Details on that division, plus Defense Secretary Rumsfeld saying the number of troops will continue to grow until the war is over. And President Bush at Camp David with British Prime Minister Tony Blair talking about the war's progress and plans for a post-Saddam Iraq. The two men having dinner together this evening and planning to meet for much more tomorrow. And the news as Fox reports now. Just past 9 p.m. on the West Coast, midnight on the East Coast, 8 a.m. in Baghdad and Operation Iraqi Freedom going into day number eight. I'm Shepard Smith in New York. It's good to have you with us as Fox reports this hour. Let's get a live report now from Greg Palcott, who's at our newsroom in Amman, Jordan. Greg? Hey, Shepard. One week on, and the bombs keep falling on Baghdad. It is daylight now there and here, but there was at least four sets of bombing runs overnight. 30 explosions were heard, especially around the TV center. That's right in the center of town, just off the Tigris River. That was hit the night before and uh, knocked off Iraqi television from the airways for several hours. Uh, we've been monitoring the Iraqi satellite television, and we don't see anything on it now. So perhaps, once again, the Allied bombers have hit their mark, and maybe Iraqi television is off the air for a little bit longer this day and for the days to come. There's other bombing, too, on the outskirts of, uh, of Baghdad, uh, uh, the bombs hitting bases of the elite Republican Guard to the south of the city. Now, this followed explosions earlier on Wednesday in Baghdad, which left as many as 15 dead, 30 injured. Happened around midday in a busy residential area. The U.S. says it was targeting nine different Iraqi missiles and launchers placed in the vicinity. And the destruction could have been caused by a misguided Iraqi air defense missile. According to the Iraqis, though, this is just another example of how the U.S. targets its own civilians. And up in northern Iraq, around the city of Mosul, armed tribesmen and Ba'ath Party members are pledging that they will defend the regime of Saddam Hussein. They're getting their weapons ready. That includes anti-tank, anti-aircraft guns, all of this not to be regarded as Brett Baer and, and you have been reporting, Shepard, the paratroopers have landed in the northern part of uh, Iraq setting up a, a northern front there and these types these bath party types and and other guerrillas have been the irregular troops that have been causing problems in the south they could cause problems in the north as well back to you Shep. greg palcott reporting live tonight greg thanks very much now the reposition of the re repositioning excuse me of the republican guard units coming out of baghdad but the defense but the defense department is playing down the size of it all and exactly what it may mean our national security correspondent, Brett Baer, live with us once again from the Pentagon. Brett? Hey, Chef, there were a lot of reports from the ground of significant Iraqi Republican Guard columns moving south of, out of Baghdad earlier tonight. Central Command now says they are seeing Republican Guard divisions on the move, but they're calling it repositioning. They've been seen preparing for battles to come, taking a defensive posture. This is video of a small number of Iraqi troops preparing to fight in the south. Now, any significant movement is welcomed by U.S. Central Command as dozens of strike aircraft are now ready to pound Iraqi Republican Guard divisions identified from the air. Now, today, 600 strike sorties were flown, hitting 100 targets, mainly the revered Hammurabi and Medina Republican Guard units. Those are the ones south of Baghdad. A lot of the sorties now uh, providing close air support to the advancing coalition troops and to also pluck out those Republican Guard divisions after they've been identified. 
Also tonight, as Greg mentioned, the Northern Front is now open in full force. 1,000 paratroopers from the 173rd Airborne Division out of Vincenza, Italy. They jumped into northern Iraq tonight. They have now secured an airfield. Right now it's being called what's uh, known as a jump and carry operation. They will eventually be bringing in heavy vehicles soon. It's the first regular army unit in the north added to the special forces uh, troops and units that have been on the ground for a number of days now working with Kurdish rebels there doing some training as well. So the northern front is open tonight. And we talked about how long this war is taking, the management of expectations and what this building is doing and saying to answer all of these questions about a possible stall. Take a listen. On the sixth day of this campaign, going against a regime that knows its days are numbered, we have air dominance, we have special forces in the north, the south, and the west. The main ground forces are moving at a, a phenomenal pace toward the north, closing in on Baghdad. We've demined the waterways so the humanitarian assistance can and is coming in. We're securing the, air, the oil fields in the south for the benefit of the Iraqi people. Most people, you spoke of some, most people would look at that and say that's pretty phenomenal for six days. We can report that that humanitarian aid has already started to funnel in. As far as the totals, the casualties for the U.S. so far, it stands at 25 dead, nine listed as missing, and seven prisoners of war. For the British, 20 dead and two missing at this hour. Chef. Brett, thanks. I, I want to ask you about this repositioning. A number of viewers are writing and saying, did, are, is it their thinking that they're coming down to engage us? Is it their thinking that the Iraqis are coming down because they think they're about to be engaged? Or, or what is the sense there? No, originally there were some reports on the ground from embedded reporters. They were being told from with their commanders who they're with uh, that there were some columns of Iraqi Republican Guard divisions on the move to the south. Now. Central Command says if that happened, it would be great because we could pluck them out one by one. What they're saying now is they are seeing some movement, but it's a, a routine procedure, they're calling it, a defensive posture uh, moving in and around Baghdad, the outer rings, and uh, they are moving, but uh, not on an offensive move toward coalition forces approaching. Brett, what, one British paper suggesting that this movement and what appears to be some, so, some sort of coordination is a sign that, that command and control is back in place in Baghdad. Is anybody commenting on this, this report and whether they think there's any credibility to it? Well, you know, they keep on saying command and control is at a minimum out of Baghdad, uh, that, uh, that Saddam Hussein's regime is losing control of the country, that the communication lines are being cut. However, uh, if there are organized movements by massive Republican Guard divisions, that would be a signal that somebody at the top is making the call. Um, no, no comment from, from the Pentagon on that today. They're still on the same line that they, they believe the command and control and communication is being cut off. Good enough. Brett Baer, live at the Pentagon. Brett, uh, we'll get back to you and uh, your colleagues there in the hour ahead. Thanks. The march into Baghdad may be slowing down as some units are going into hunting mode, trying to clear out these pockets of Iraqi op. In the shocking close up pictures broadcast by Al Jazeera last night. They claim that these show UK personnel killed during recent operations. Quite apart from the obvious distress that such pictures could cause friends and families of the personnel concerned, such disgraceful behavior is a flagrant breach of the Geneva Convention. We have yet to undertake formal identification, but it is probable that these are the two UK personnel who were listed as missing last Sunday. Next of kin have been informed that the two soldiers have now been categorized missing, believed killed. Our thoughts are with their families and friends. The decision by Al Jazeera to broadcast such material is deplorable, and we call on them to desist from future broadcasts of such a nature. I appreciate that all media outlets have a strong desire for the exclusive, but 
we have no desire to limit journalistic freedom in any way. However, all media outlets must be aware of the limits of taste and decency and be wary that they do not unwittingly become the tools of the Iraqi regime. Over recent days, UK forces have been extremely active. The Royal Navy, the United States Navy, including mine clearance dolphins, and Australian naval forces have been involved in a massive operation to sweep the shallow waters leading to the port of Umm Qasar. The Royal Navy have taken the lead in this operation as they are acknowledged as the world experts in this type of work. Additionally, divers from the Royal Navy and the Australian Navy have been clearing the port area. The mine threat to shipping in the Khor Abdullah has so far prevented humanitarian, humanitarian aid from being delivered by ship to the Iraqi people. Make no mistake, the threat is very real. Last night, UK mine hunters discovered and then detonated two mines outside the swept shipping channel. This proves beyond doubt that Saddam's regime has attempted to stop essential stores and humanitarian supplies from being delivered to his own people. This also illustrates his disregard for civilian shipping, which may have encountered these mines. The close cooperation between the three coalition naval forces has cleared a channel, but the overnight discovery of mines just outside the swept channel may de now delay the arrival of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, Sir Galahad, and her cargo of over 200 tonnes of aid donated by both the Kuwaiti and UK governments. The humanitarian aid includes bulk food, such as rice, lentils and chickpeas, flour, bottled water, and World Health Organization medical packs. In the interim, essential humanitarian supplies are being delivered over land. Turning now to land operations, three commando brigade and the US 15 Marine Expeditionary Unit have completed operations to mop up the last remnants of resistance on the Al Four Peninsula. They have secured Umm Qasar and three commando brigade are already starting the process of normalization. You have all seen remarkable TV pictures of the Royal Marines engaging with the local population. After decades of repression from Saddam's regime, it is a testament to the professionalism of our forces that the Iraqi people are getting their first taste of freedom. Life is already moving on. There are already children being born who will never have to suffer under this regime. 4-2 Commando are now sweeping the town to remove weapons and explosives left behind by Iraqi forces. Most of you will have seen the coverage of weapons finds within a school in Umm Qasar. While life is returning to normality for some, there are of course still many others who have yet to be liberated. Elements of 7 Armoured Brigade and 16 Air Assault Brigade have been in action over recent days around Basra and Azubaya. In both these locations, UK forces have been taking the fight to the remnants of the regime's paramilitary forces, including the Special Security Organization and the Ba'ath Party militia. When we put together the force package for this operation, we knew we would have to deal with regime paramilitaries. Our force was therefore designed with this in mind. The UK have developed highly effective and experienced infantry and Royal Marines who are expert in this type of operation. The regime paramilitaries are beginning to realize the level of our expertise. In Azubaya, members of, the, uh, of one division took swift and crucial action in the early hours of 26th of March against these forces, killing around 20 personnel, and in a separate action, they captured a senior Ba'ath Party 
paramilitary official. There is still regime paramilitary activity in this town, but at a much reduced level. UK forces are dealing with the remnants of it on an opportunity basis. In Basra, we've come up against some stiff opposition from a mixture of regime paramilitaries and the remnants of uh, the Iraqi army's 51st Division, who we believe have been coerced by the regime to reoccupy their equipment. On Tuesday, one UK armored division using AS-90 self-propelled guns and uh, destroyed 11 firing positions for heavy mortars, D-30 artillery and some T-55 tanks, and they were on the outskirts of the city. Later that day, a column of around 20 armored vehicles left Basra in an attempt to engage UK forces. They were destroyed by a combination of AS-90 artillery, coalition aircraft including Tornado GR-4 and Harrier GR-7, and three commando brigade using Milan. As darkness fell on Tuesday, UK forces saw the first signs of overt resistance to the regime's grip in Basra. Sporadic small arms fire was reported in one area of the city, and regime paramilitaries started firing mortars and artillery at their own people. UK artillery responded by destroying these regime artillery and mortar positions. The Bath Party command element was also effectively targeted in the early hours of Wednesday morning. Basra was calmer throughout the majority of Wednesday, but again a column of Iraqi tanks and armoured vehicles left Basra heading southwest towards UK forces. Having established that these forces were not trying to surrender, UK forces took swift and decisive action against this threat, destroying a number through a mixture of artillery and coalition air power. The people of Basra are starting to recognise that UK forces will deal decisively and on our terms with the remnants of the regime. Elements of 7 Armoured Brigade and 16 Air Assault Brigade have secured the Ramallah oil fields and our explosive ordnance disposal teams are continuing the difficult and dangerous task of clearing the munitions and booby traps that the regime has left behind. Coalition and Q80 firefighters are dealing with the wellhead fires in a systematic and effective way. Three wellhead fires have been extinguished and they are working on the remaining six wellheads that were set ablaze by, uh, when the regime retreated. These oil fields are critical to the future and the prosperity of Iraq. It's estimated it will cost around $1 billion to get the oil infrastructure to allow the field to yield its capacity of about 1.8 million barrels a day. And we expect that Iraq will be exporting oil within three months as part of the Oil for Food program. Apart from providing close air support to ground operations, the Royal Air Force has been flying around 100 sorties a day. In addition to our offensive sorties, our tankers and our AWACS play a key supporting role in the coalition air effort. Our Tornado GR4s and Harrier GR7s have attacked targets ranging from regime headquarters, ammunition dumps, airfields, integrated air defense system installations, and Iraqi fielded forces. Meanwhile, the RAF Tornado F3s have been uh, providing fighter patrols to protect airfields, land forces, and high-value air assets. The Joint Helicopter Force, including RAF Chinooks and Pumas, Royal Navy Sea Kings and Army Lynx, have been supporting ground and maritime forces throughout the UK area of operations. And the RAF Regiment have been providing airfield security to allied airfields, providing short-range air defence, and have also deployed into Iraq to protect a forward operating base for helicopter operations. UK forces will continue to make a significant contribution to all aspects of coalition operations across the whole theatre until we achieve our objectives. We will not rest until this regime and the threat it poses to the world through weapons of mass destruction are both eradicated.
I'd be happy to take some questions. Uh, go for it. Uh, British and US uh, forces uh, said that their war will be uh, clean. Uh, and I think our uh, decision is uh, uh, to show our audience the truth, even it is dirty <coughs> war. Uh, we are in Al Jazeera not a part of a coalition, uh, nor a part of the Iraqi regime. We are independent media. <coughs> Thank you. That was your statement, was it, or was there a question there? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Did you ask a question? I have no question. You have no question. Let me just say in response that I know that Al Jazeera's management wants to produce a station which they can be proud of. They want to produce a station that engages in balanced reporting. That type of reporting is neither balanced, nor should anybody take any pride in it. Take it from me. Um, Kevin Dunn of ITV News. Uh, Air Marshal, can I ask you about the overnight engagement um, outside Basra? Can you give us more details on the outcome of that? And do, do you assess that regular Iraqi forces have now abandoned Basra? <coughs> and what kind of resistance is there? And when will you be able to assure the civilian population that you're going to go in and relieve the town? Okay. Um, several questions there. But uh, l l let me paint the tapestry. Um, what we have in a city like Basra, 1.3 million people, is the classic um, mosaic of the regime security pro procedures. They've got um, various different organizations, such as the Special Security Organization, the Ba'ath Militia, the odd Fayadeen, but not, not probably many. But they are, they are para paramilitaries who live above the law, have ruled the roost for years, and they uh, just see that the only way they can work this is to intimidate the regular army who have uh, already deserted. And they're doing that by uh, exemplar executions, they're doing that by um, um, executing families of the soldiers concerned. So that's the atmosphere that's in there. So on the one hand, we've got to deal with that, and we are. On the other hand, there is um, existing still this climate of fear that the regime built up over many, many years, and it takes a huge effort to win the hearts of minds of people who have been subjected to that sort of fear over that length of time. And that is what we're going to do. And we will take as long as it takes. And the most important thing is to keep reassuring the people of Basra that we're there and that's what we're doing. And they're seeing it. Yeah, Jonathan Marcus, uh, BBC. Could you tell us, please, um, you've said that you expected uh, resistance from these irregular formations. Could you tell us whether you think the level of the resistance and the doggedness of the resistance is indeed more than you had expected? And can you give us a little bit of a picture of what is happening, obviously, outside the British area, further uh, to the northwest? Sure. Um, it was always going to be hard to judge, uh, because uh, we're dealing with intangibles here. Um, we knew um, how the regime would seek to apply friction to our progress. And the fact that we're using uh, or we're seeing irregular forces and we're particularly seeing the, um, the activity against uh, deserting regular forces by those security apparatuses, uh, that, that isn't surprising. What um, is always difficult to judge is the degree to which uh, the the view of the people, if you like, will or will not triumph over that. It depends on the degree of fear they've been under, as I've said, and I think we'll find in different places that equation is, is balanced differently. So not really surprised um, uh, about the, the way in which these irregular forces are being used, but you know, they are nevertheless uh, dangerous and determined men who need sorting out and sorting out they will. You wanted something on the bigger picture. Um, let me simply say that um, the end state for this campaign is the removal of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, in order to do that, we've got to remove the regime. The regime lives in Baghdad, therefore the center of gravity of this campaign is Baghdad. Number of lines of operation to allow us to do that. Um, the conventional line of operation you're seeing plenty of with um, the classic use of maneuver using armor, the classic use of air power, and uh, an unconventional line of operation 
which is the sort of thing I've been talking about in, in Basra. And uh, our forces are moving into position to reach that end state. I'm sorry I can't go into huge amounts of detail on that. Over there, please, glasses. Um, can I just ask you, Air Marshal Bage, if you can tell us any more about the small arms fire that you say was um, fired by some of the civilians in Basra the other night? In other words, what kind of group or grouping it was? And also, just on the picture that uh, Jonathan just asked you about outside the British area, the Iraqi division seem to have been moving south. Can you tell us what you think they're up to and why they're doing it? Um, the, um, it, it's very hard to say with any uh, degree of certainty what the ground truth is of um, the sort of situation that started off in Basra. But I would guess, and I mean a, an educated guess based on my knowledge and understanding of these situations, is that uh, probably someone the Ba'ath Party were trying to um, intimidate wasn't going to be intimidated, and so they shot him. And uh, you know, that's the way of these things. In counterinsurgency warfare, that tends to be the way these things start to get unhinged, because someone uh, develops either the courage or the recklessness occasionally to, to fight back, say, no, I'm not going to put up with this. Um, and your other question was? Uh, Divisions moving south oh, yeah. overnight, yeah. and why they're doing it. And um, the, um, uh, I'm not convinced that um, there is what you um, and I would perhaps call a division moving anywhere. I think there are, there are inevitably, it's very fluid. I mean, I describe it as, as probably the classic ambiguous battle space, but I sense that um, y you know, what we're seeing is people trying to. Um, uh, to surrender, desert, or whatever, realizing what's going on with the Bath Party and uh, the others who are trying to apply their motivation and trying to avoid them. It's a very difficult and confused situation. Sorry, you're being very patient. Sheet <laughs> Hunt, BBC News. Time and again at that podium, people like yourself and the Americans insist that the resistance you are experiencing on the ground was predictable. Time and again, we hear a different story from commanders in the field talking to embedded journalists who express surprise. Would you accept that both you both underestimated the nature of the resistance and misrepresented the nature of this war to the British audience and the international audience watching this news conference live? Um, I don't believe that... Um, I mean, I, <clears throat> I can speak for myself, I can speak for the UK. I don't believe we've uh, misrepresented... Uh, if you're talking about military spokesmen, I don't believe we've misrepresented uh, anything. Um, we give you the best ground truth as we see it. The fact is that uh, we now understand what's going on in Basra uh, to a greater degree uh, than um, clearly we could have predicted on the basis of it's actually going on, if you see what I mean. And as I said to a previous question, until you actually see what's happening, uh, it's very difficult to make judgments. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested um, what you say about uh, what forces are saying to the embeds because that's not what's coming back to me. Uh, commanders um, recognize what's going on, so British commanders recognize what's going on and uh, uh, act accordingly. Let's come over here. Yeah, Neil Frelinski with ABC News. Uh, we know there's concern uh, in Baghdad that buildings will be booby trapped to kill large numbers of coalition troops moving through the area. Have you seen any evidence of anything like that? in Basra or any of these other places? Well, I've seen it on the uh, classic example is uh, in the oil infrastructure where um, many of the wellheads and the, um, the control mechanisms were, were indeed um, set for demolition. And, and that's why we've had to be very careful in the way in which we've, um, we've dealt with it. And we anticipate uh, precisely that anywhere else. Uh, this is the way irregular forces operate. At this point, you Sorry, I'll I need to move on. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah go. Yes, uh, Tom Interior with CNN, uh, Air Marshal. Uh, we have been given the indication that uh, this is a rather unorganized group in Basra, but you're telling us uh, today that two columns of armor, APCs, tanks, made their way out of Basra to engage UK forces. Uh, how would you rate the opposition in Basra at this tower? Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I mean, picture the scene. Um, these militias, um, probably the Ba'ath Party militia, go through a neighborhood, round up the existing soldiery, put them in their tanks and say, go that way. 
And you can tell from the way they're dispossessed operationally that this isn't a fighting formation that uh, really knows its business. Um, th that's the way it is. That it is disorganized, but it is, there is someone in there trying to organize it. It's totally different from that conventional line of operation that I referred to, where uh, you are actually dealing with forces who can maneuver, forces who have intelligence, forces who have a picture on which to go. So it's very different from that. <coughs> Sky News, we're in the second week of this now. Um, we're constantly being told in this room that everything's on track, on the timeline. Are you seriously telling us you, that you're exactly where you want it to be without a single major center of population mm. under coalition control? Are you coming under, or what kind of political pressure are you coming under to get a move on and deliver the sort of victories, the quick victories, on which public support was so conditional? Um, I think uh, the military mind, seeing a city of 1.3 million people in which you know a security apparatus has been operating for a long time, it was quite clear that that was never going to be quick. I mean, we sadly have enormous experience in Belfast, and we know how fluid these situations can become, and how it isn't like turning on a light switch. So, um, you know, forgive me, we, this is the way we think, and, and we, th we, we tend to think on the basis of our previous experience, and we tend to think conservatively. As for coming under political pressure, no, none at all. Um, this, uh, you've heard me say this many times, this will take as long as it takes. Military campaigning does, and that's the way it is. And, and you know, we're not playing out to, um, to, to some sort of script for, uh, for the benefit of anybody. It takes as long as it takes, it's got to be that way. Abu Dhabi Television. I have a simple question. Sorry, I missed your uh, your companies. Abu Dhabi Television. Okay. Yeah, I have a simple question. You mentioned something about uh, Iraq will be able to resume uh, oil exporting uh, in uh, three months. Yeah. Do you expect that the war will be over in this uh, time period? Well, um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, <laughs> but um, given that we have secured the oil fields in the south, if if they were a, uh, a modern set of oil fields, as we see anywhere else in the Gulf, we could be pumping now. The fact is, they're in terrible condition, and they need to be made safe, and obviously there's damage from the fires. But the, um, the civil engineering part of that uh, will take three months, and at that stage we can flow oil, and that's, that's in a secure area. But you were speaking about South only South oil wells, or... Uh, I'm only speaking about the south because it's only the south that's in the British area and uh, I'm not an oil expert as you can probably tell. Jeff Schaefer, Associated Press Television News. We keep hearing from the podium that the conflict that's so far been waged by the coalition has the Iraqi leadership on the run uh, in disarray. I mean, what evidence do you have, if you call Baghdad the center of gravity, that the leadership is in disarray? Have there been any high-level defections? Um, and do you still believe that Saddam Hussein is firmly in place, is still running the war effort from his side? Second question, completely different. There's news that broke about 10 minutes ago, early reports of a friendly fire episode in Nazaria involving U.S. Marines. Can you speak to that at all? Um, to take your second question first, I mean, I've been standing here for half an hour, so uh, uh, I'm afraid I can't. And, and in any effect, um, uh, U.S. actions would take rather longer to reach me as the U.K. commander. Um, on your first point, um, the degree to which um, the Iraqi regime has control, um, there are a number of indications, um, and I would start right from the beginning with uh, the way they're um, uh, seemingly not reacting to events with the disposition of their forces. Um, were the pos uh, positions reversed, then um, I'm afraid I'd have my corps and armoured divisions in a very different disposition, and I'm surely not going to tell you what that is. But there, there are signs that um, there are, the reaction to events is poor. There are also signs that um, they are finding it uh, exceedingly difficult to maintain uh, communication amongst themselves and thereby exercise command and control. But actually, it, it, it doesn't... Individuals don't matter to me. Uh, all I'm interested in is knowing that we've uh, cracked the regime and they're, they're no longer there, they're no longer in a position to, uh, to do anything, and that's what we're after. Brian 
Bob Roberts from the Daily Mirror. You mentioned the uh, British dead. Can you also give us your reaction to the innocent civilians killed in Baghdad yesterday? And uh, would you like to apologise to their family and friends? Um, the, uh, are you referring um, to anything in particular? The residential building. Um, OK. I, I, I'm not actually aware of what you're uh, referring to, but um, you, you, you know that... Um, I, uh, I sp I mean, which killed more than 20 people. Right, OK. Um, first of all, um, it is uh, by no means clear, and there's quite an extensive investigation going on to, uh, to see um, what was the cause of that. Secondly, as you know well, because I've explained it to you, we go to enormous lengths to avoid civilian casualties. Any deaths in civilian communities in war are regrettable. There is no doubt about that. And uh, enormous parts of my day are spent in dealing with targets to minimize that risk. And uh, it's a job we take very seriously. It's a very responsible job. And it's one I discharge with, uh, with enormous attention to detail. from The Guardian. Can you tell us who is going to run the port at Umm Qasar? I've seen suggestions that it's going to be an American firm. Is that what you want? Um, initially, um, we, we'll do it with our own, um, uh, our own military units. Um, uh, subsequently, um, I, I don't know what arrangements will go into place. But um, in, in all these aspects of running infrastructure, uh, the best outcome is that we find that the people who ran it before are still there and able to run it uh, rather than having to, uh, to do anything else because that, that's absolutely the best outcome. It's uh, Iraqi capabilities in Iraqi hands for the benefit of the Iraqi economy. Yeah, sorry, over the back now. Uh, Robert Hodier in Army Times. Can you give us a little detail about this column that uh, broke out of Basra last night? How many vehicles, what nature the vehicles were? how many of them you destroyed, and where you think the ones you didn't destroy are now. And as a follow-on to that, how do you see it working that the Ba'ath Party officials get people into tanks with machine guns and cannons and maintain an effective control and force them to go into combat? Oh, they coerce their families. They, they go to their houses and hold a gun to the f heads of the families. That's how it's done. Other than the potentially self-serving statements from POWs, what evidence do you have of that? Um, uh, well, <laughs> I, why do you say self-serving statements? I didn't want to fight. They made me do it. No. Uh, well, uh, you know, the, the, there is evidence. Um, your first question, I work at the operational level of war, so tactical detail that happened only uh, hours ago is not something that falls on my plate. I can give you the general generality, which is what I've given you, but um, I don't do detail of that sort. Marshall, <coughs> don't you think that British people watching at home would be very concerned to hear the commander of British forces in the Gulf say, I don't do detail? These are their soldiers and indeed their sons and daughters' lives that are on the line. No, I don't do uh, the, uh, the sort of that, that sort of detail in terms of putting things on a map. I, uh, and make no mistake about that, I, my major responsibility is for the lives and minimising the risk of all... Um, all UK armed forces, and uh, I'm slightly offended that you think it would be otherwise. Air Marshal, can you clarify whether you meant to... Uh, sorry, Jim Wolf, Reuters. Can you clarify whether you meant to accuse Al Jazeera of a flagrant breach of the Geneva Convention, or you meant to accuse Iraq of a flagrant no, breach? Uh, Iraq uh, has the flagrant breach of the Geneva Convention uh, on its plate, yeah. What do you suppose was the military objective of this breakout from Basra? What were they trying to do? Why would they leave the cover of uh, civilians all around them and go out and engage you folks in the night? Sorry, why would who do that? Why would the militia who, who broke out of Basra, what was their military objective? Why did they leave the city? Why would they leave the cover that they have of the civilians? The ones coming south? Or do no, you mean one? in Basra. Yeah, the, well, there's been some coming south in armor who've come to fight. They've been made to fight. There are others who are trying to leave um, so they can get away um, for, their, uh, for their own safety. Um, it's as simple as that. Go on. Go on. David Schuster from NBC News. You talked about a lot about the fear 
uh, that is keeping some of these forces doing what they're doing in places like Basra and the need for a rebellion against this fear. But I'm wondering to what degree is such a rebellion going to be, be required for successful occupation of a place like Baghdad and is it realistic to expect that there can be such a rebellion against fear in Iraq's capital? I, I think so because um, you've got two lines of operation coming together at Baghdad. Um, you've got um, dealing with a, a city, dealing with urban warfare as we're doing in Basra and at the same time you've got the regime collapsing and that will act as, um, as an enormous catalyst. So the two come together at that point. Last question. A line one from USA Today. You mentioned that you had captured a senior Ba'ath Party official. I was wondering if the UK had the opportunity to question him yet and what sort of insight he gave you into mm. the workings of the regime and what was actually going on uh, where he was. Um, uh, yes, I confirm that we have caught a, a senior Ba'ath Party official. We have not yet um, uh, conducted detailed questioning, so we as yet have no insight from that source. Thank you very much. All right, Air Marshal Brian Burridge uh, addressing a number of different issues, starting and, and almost ending with uh, Al Jazeera, uh, dis uh, skewering them, if you will, over uh, some pictures, a video that they had shown uh, of uh, UK soldiers who had been apparently executed, and uh, this is the kind of thing they say you should should not be on the air and they asked them not to put it on the air also uh, he talked about the the fact that demining was still going on that the the mines that existed in the Persian Gulf was keeping aid from getting to the people that need it uh, he talked about the oil infrastructure that had been damaged and interestingly he talked about Basra and the uprising there we just have this coming in a few minutes ago uh, there was a report that there were some um, there was a column of vehicles coming out of Basra and apparently trying to attack the British troops. Those, and this is just coming in as he was talking, those have been destroyed. The coalition forces have destroyed that column, about 20 vehicles that left Basra. And uh, a, a final thought that he had there about uh, there could possibly be an uprising like we've seen in Basra. That's what he was saying, is this was an uprising inside there because there were conflicting reports before an uprising. Uh, and that that is a possibility in Baghdad as well. And, of course, that would be the hope of coalition forces. Air Marshal uh, Brian Burridge also urged patience when he talked about the efforts to secure Basra. He said, you know, there's still paramilitary forces in the city and, um, you know, this is going to take time and for all the people who may be frustrated about the relief that may not be getting in there as quickly as possible, he said, please be patient. Um, there's still paramilitary forces around. Let's take a look at some video we have coming in. Uh, one of the locations within Iraq as uh, uh, the forces, the coalition forces approach Baghdad is Najaf and that has been uh, a scene and right here we're showing you some video that's come in some of these uh, efforts to take out some of the Iraqi vehicles and um, uh, some of their troops which have set up some sort of resistance there are different theories as to who uh, it constitutes the re resistance whether these are people that are being forced to fight whether they're part of uh, uh, Saddam's uh, favorite troops uh, not apparently the uh, Republican Guard uh, even though there are reports of uh, some of those troops coming out of Baghdad and heading southward. And I, I wanted to bring in, uh, uh, once again, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Haig uh, and give us a feel for why would this make sense? Why would they be repositioning uh, these forces outside of Baghdad? Yeah, I think, uh, one, you're up now against their last line of defense and to, to guard the city. So you have from what we know, two divisions to the south of the city, two heavy divisions. And uh, probably there's some maneuvering around because the Marines are now moving up, our Marines are moving to the north. In fact, your Rick, who's on the ground with them, reported that very well. But they're moving up. So from what the Iraqis see of our movement, they're seeing constant shifting now. And in fact, as the command has promised for the last couple of days, they're, they're starting to get a lot of surprises. The airborne drop tonight, et cetera. So they're probably rearranging their defenses. In fact, I think General Myers, you know, there were early reports in the day today, there was a thousand vehicle column. And uh, the chairman said, look, yeah, yeah, but it's just repositioning inside of their perimeter. But uh, aren't the, the coalition forces licking their chops? If that's their repositioning, they're going to be sitting ducks. 
Um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, that's a problem for the Iraqis is as they move. Do the Iraqis targets. know the capabilities that the coalition forces have against uh, even armored vehicles? And we don't know that they're armored vehicles. Uh, there's some reports that they were tanks moving out of Baghdad. Yeah. But do they know the capabilities the coalition forces have? Bob, you know, you have veterans of the first Gulf War uh, who are on the Iraqi side, but a lot of the younger troops and a lot of the younger officers know. They've never experienced this. And so in fact, nobody's several. told them. They've told them, go here, go there, and have not told them the dangers. Right. In fact, I think one of the points the Air Marshal pointed out is that some of these columns that were coming out of Najarif, these were columns of essentially conscripted soldiers who were ordered by the Ba'athist uh, thugs mm -hmm. to climb in those tanks and go attack those columns. And the, 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 the UK spokesperson was talking about that just moments yeah, that's ago. that's correct, yeah. And that's a sad, that's a very sad state. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to bring in Keith Rosencrantz. He's our former Air Force captain, uh, eight years in the Air Force as an F F-16 pilot. And uh, Captain, I understand that you have quite a few things to say in response to what you heard from Air Marshal Brian Barrage. Well, one of the points I'd like to make that I think is very important that your viewers understand is that one of the reporters asked him or confronted him about some civilian casualties within the city of Baghdad. If you recall, in the early nights of the uh, air campaign, you saw all the AAA being fired up into the air, a lot of surface air missiles. Those things go up and they come back down. And this happened in the Gulf War itself. A lot of those, you know, missiles and, and shells came back and hit some of their own areas. And oftentimes, the coalition forces are blamed for possibly taking out some civilians when, in fact, it was the, the Iraqi missiles that dropped back down and did that. You know, it was interesting, uh, just at the very beginning of this, Bob mentioned it, that the news conference began and ended with Al Jazeera. Captain, wasn't it interesting how um, Air Marshal Burridge asked the Al Jazeera reporter right away, he said, do you have a question? And he said, no, I have a statement. And uh, the Air Marshal jumped right on him and, and said, well, you know, there needs to be a question here. There's, there's a lot of propaganda involved with that. And, and I understand that, and I understand what their purpose is. But at the same time, if you look at what Saddam Hussein is trying to do, he's not helping his cause when he goes out and executes POWs and then goes and shows that on Al Jazeera. Yeah, and he has shown the, the POWs, which is one of the things that he was talking about. Um, it, who is he playing to for that? Who wants to see that. I assume the people that support him, but outside of Iraq, outside of his Republican Guard and the people close to him that, that hope that he survives, the Arab world, they want to see that? Well, there are a lot of people in the Arab world that do not like Americans, and I think we've realized that over the last couple of years, especially with 9-11, and there's a lot of hatred there, and, and I think he's playing to that hatred by showing these people this footage. Uh, if you'll stand by, sir, we wanted to bring in Rick Leventhal, who is uh, traveling uh, with the, the 1st Marine uh, Division. Uh, Rick, what's going on? Well, we're, uh, we're pushing further north, closer to an objective that uh, the Marines are uh, going to be securing today. And I, and I have, am now hearing the, uh, the howitzers, uh, the heavy artillery, is firing once again behind us, over our heads. Not sure what the intended target is. We can't see where the shells are landing, but keep in mind that they can tra travel uh, for more than a dozen miles, uh, if necessary, through the air. We're also seeing uh, a lot of Marines uh, in uh, fighting positions, flying uh, along the sides of the road, pointing rifles in both directions uh, to ensure that uh, that there are no uh, no attacks made on the Marine convoy as it continues to head north. Uh, it's also interesting that even though we've reached a, a sort of a different type of area, a lot of farms, we still see bunkers and, uh, and fighting positions, Iraqi fighting positions built along the roadside uh, with sandbags and that sort of thing. Um, the noise that you're hearing is the, uh, the turret turning on our LAV as uh, Captain John Custis continues to scan the horizon and as we continue to push forward and provide security for some of these Marines, uh, he may see something off uh, to our left. Uh, earlier today, we actually uh, reached a milestone of sorts. We passed under a, uh, a Baghdad sign on the highway, and Lori asked me about the uh, motivation for the Marines earlier. Well, that provides some motivation. They're, they're excited to be getting closer to that objective, and uh, they're pretty happy to see that sign, guys. Hey, Rick, you said that the Marines 
were in fighting position. Has any fighting actually begun? Have you been hearing any kind of uh, firing from either side? Well, we were told earlier today before we pushed north that there had been fighting ahead of us. And uh, along the way, we've seen some evidence of that. In fact, we just passed the burned out hulk of a truck along the side of the road that looked pretty fresh. Um, we also saw another dead body along the road today. And uh, we saw uh, artillery shells, not artillery, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 25 millimeter shells along the side of the road that these vehicles, uh, that these LAVs fire. But I have not personally heard any gunfire since we left and I haven't personally seen or we haven't been involved in any ourselves. And uh, again, I, I, I heard the, uh, the, the artillery, heavy artillery firing, but uh, that's the extent of it so far. All right, Rick Leventhal, uh, traveling with the 1st Marine 3rd LAR Division. Uh, thanks very much, Rick. We always appreciate it when you call in and uh, we'll talk to you very soon. All right, and now we want to take you to CENTCOM headquarters where David Lee Miller is standing by. And uh, David, I hope that you'll bring us up to date for people who may just be joining us on the briefing that was here, held by Air Marshal Brian Burridge. That's right, Laurie. Just ended a few moments ago. Air Marshal Brian Burridge spoke to the media here at CENTCOM headquarters in Doha. It was the first time that uh, he has participated in a news briefing like this, and he is sort of the British equivalent, if you will, to the U.S. General Tommy Franks. One of the first things he said during this news conference that uh, was very significant is that he disputed reports that have been circulating now for about 24 hours that there is a column of Republican Guard, a convoy, according to some intelligence reports that have been distributed, 1,000 strong, heading in the direction of U.S. Marines. He essentially disputed that report and said that uh, it was uh, not correct and that he's not sure that the Republican Guard, he said, is moving anywhere, adding to that this was a confusing situation. And a great deal was discussed during this news conference regarding the city of Basra. This is a city of 1.3 million Iraqis. It is the second largest city in the country, and it is a location where many fear there could be a humanitarian disaster disaster now brewing. He said that in that city there are still resistance fighters loyal to Saddam Hussein. He described them as paramilitary fighters and they are providing uh, significant resistance to the coalition forces. And one reason for that is he said that they're essentially uh, recruiting people at the point of a gun. The um, elite forces there, the Ba'ath Party leadership going home to home and simply uh, telling the uh, uh, Iraqi civilian population that they have to participate in this resistance or else they effectively are going to uh, face uh, the consequences of this regime. And for that reason, he says, mainly intimidation, the fighting there is continuing. But he also said that there was a convoy of about uh, 20 or, or so um, armored vehicles that uh, tried to leave Basra. The uh, city is effectively surrounded now by the British and British forces were successful in destroying destroying that convoy. Nevertheless, uh, the situation there still remains tense and to a great extent also uncertain. He also said during the news conference that for the most part the al Panin Peninsula has been secured, the port of Umm um Qusar is uh, now secure, but he also said bringing humanitarian aid in is going to be a problem in light of a discovery made overnight. They've been sweeping for mines and they say now they found uh, additional mines outside the area that has already been swept. And as you have uh, made much of already this morning, another very contentious subject that came up during this news conference, British POWs that, uh, or I should say British uh, war dead actually, their uh, photographs were put on uh, Al Jazeera, the Arab language satellite television station, and uh, the uh, Air Marshal uh, wasted no time in describing uh, what took place as uh, disgusting and uh, shocking uh, broadcast by Al Jazeera. Let's listen now to his own words about the Al Jazeera broadcast of uh, British war dead. I'd like to start by addressing the shocking close-up pictures broadcast by Al Jazeera last night. They claim that these show UK personnel killed during recent operations. Quite apart from the obvious distress that such pictures could cause friends and families of the personnel concerned, such disgraceful behaviour is a flagrant breach of the Geneva Convention. 
Now, the Al Jazeera correspondent who was participating in this news conference wasted no time. He put his hand up. He shouted out Al Jazeera, and the air marshal uh, pointed to him. He stood up. We expected to hear a question. Instead, he read a brief statement saying essentially that Al Jazeera is only trying to uh, broadcast the truth. The uh, air marshal disputed that and uh, stood firm to his position that what Al Jazeera was doing was simply unacceptable. And finally now, Laurie, uh, one other very interesting point that was raised in the news conference. The air marshal said that uh, he expects that uh, within the next three months, the uh, Iraqi oil wells in the southern part of the country will be uh, producing product that uh, can be sold. He was questioned on that point. Does that mean then that you expect the war to be over by three months? And he simply uh, took the position that uh, in three months' time, uh, he expects the oil fires to effectively be under control in that area and the sale of oil to uh, continue as normal. As to whether or not this conflict will entirely be over by then, uh, that's a point that uh, is still uh, uncertain. That's the latest from CENTCOM headquarters in Doha. Back to you. All right, David Lee Miller, thanks very much for summing it up very concisely for us. We appreciate it. Uh, bring back in uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Haig once again. Um, Colonel, uh, the president has a lot on his plate right now. He's got uh, more than just this thing going on in Iraq. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I, well, I think that's a, it's a great point and a great question to bring up at this point because, you know, if you go back during the 90s, the great debate was over whether to retain a, a two or a two and a half war military capability. And that debate even came up again about a year ago um, around the September 11th time frame. And what we're seeing right now, and I think it's a, it's a fairly impressive thing, in the White House, um, of course, there's a great deal of attention on Iraq. But at the same time, you have a half a war going on in Afghanistan, and there is shooting going on. And at the same time, you have North Korea, uh, of course, in alert status and, and, and threatening dire consequences. So what you have is the White House that is really managing a number of crises at once, which is, I think, always the great test for any president. And then there's the... the criticism that you're hearing, valid or not, th th from some people and even some retired military folks saying uh, this isn't a big enough force to accomplish what you want to do in Iraq. Do you agree with that? No, I, I, think, I think they're probably short a division that they intended to use because of Turkey, but they're getting Turkey, it there quickly. Which yeah. uh, they're moving into position. Yeah. And, you know, and also I, what I recall uh, Mr. Rumsfeld saying before the invasion was that there was going to be a sort of a role in the forces that would just continue as the ground fighting was, was occurring. So I, and this strikes me as consistent with Well, it may be said. going on right now. I mean, we're not seeing everything as, as uh, Secretary Rumsfeld has made clear. Even with these embedded journalists, you are not seeing a war. You are seeing slices of a war. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true, and, it, and also it's important to realize that we do have certain forces that are right now performing a deterrent function with regard to, to Korea. Um, let's bring in Steve Santani, who's standing by in Kuwait City. And um, Steve, we just heard from the, the leader of the British forces saying uh, there were lots of developments going on, but some people had expressed frustration that the aid might not be getting into the south as quickly as possible. But he said, hey, there are still some mines in the area. We need to be patient. Certainly that has been a major story in, in the southern areas, getting aid to the people who need it. Uh, what's the latest from there, Steve? Well, that's right. It certainly has been a huge concern of coalition forces trying to get aid into southern Iraq and then hopefully eventually throughout Iraq. Uh, there's been an on-again, off-again effort, uh, on-again, off-again declaration that the waterways leading up to Umkasar, uh, the main deep water port in the south, have been cleared. Uh, first we hear they are, then the British say they aren't, and now we're finding out that a couple of mines were found off the shipping channel, but nonetheless in that waterway, presenting a clear danger to any ships that could come up that way, and uh, those were found and destroyed. Uh, uh, several days ago we had uh, two fishing dows that were full of mines, before that two tugboats that were full of mines. We haven't heard too much about mines that have actually been deployed in the water, already uh, in the water waiting for ships uh, to destroy them, uh, but certainly there is a continuing danger and you heard uh, the air marshal say today that uh, two other mines were found. So uh, that means uh, the uh, major shipments, the big shipments of humanitarian aid aboard vessels, large vessels, uh, will probably have to hold off for at least another day or so. And that's what they're waiting for down there, to get uh, shipments in large volumes into Mkasar, where people can uh, get fresh food and fresh water and the medical supplies they need because they are suffering from there. 
course, it needs to go up to Basra, where you heard the air marshal say there's been stiff resistance. That standoff continuing for the uh, third or fourth day now as British troops surround the city and we have some kind of uprising inside. The British firing their artillery at the artillery positions inside, uh, at the Iraqi positions inside. So that standoff continuing and uh, the effort uh, to get to humanitarian aid to Basra obviously hindered by that. People in Basra are suffering as much as the people in Umkasa. In fact, they apparently don't have enough fresh water, uh, and there are worries that if they don't get it soon, there could be an outbreak of cholera. We had a, a British commander who's on the scene down there in Basra describing the very chaotic situation around the city. If we have that uh, sound now, we can play it. They're all firing, wearing civilian clothes, and they're firing uh, under the, the white flag as well, which creates a lot of confusion for us. So, at the end of the day, I mean, if anybody's looking suspicious or anything, they can't they end up getting us. And there are some people fleeing Basra as well. We've got some pictures of at least one family uh, fleeing on a road, uh, trying to get out of that city. As I mentioned, a terrible shortage of food and water. They're trying to find safety, trying to find supplies and sustenance somewhere else. And as I mentioned, there is a worry about a possible outbreak of disease there. Humanitarian aid hasn't found its way to Basra yet, but it has found its way into Umkasar, the port city. It came overland by a convoy from Kuwait City, and it arrived yesterday. And to say it was welcomed with open arms is an understatement. In fact, people scrambled for that humanitarian aid as soon as it arrived. The trucks pulled up, the boxes were thrown off the back, and people were fighting each other, grabbing each other's legs and arms, trying to get to those supplies and to feed their families. So uh, the effort continuing to open up southern Iraq to humanitarian aid and the effort continuing to uh, try to uh, uh, resolve the situation in Basra, the second largest city in Iraq. Lori, back to you. Steve Santani in Kuwait City, thank you very much. Lieutenant Colonel Brian Haig, um, your thoughts here. If, once again, he's sitting right here, and it, it, I keep looking at, at him, and you see the side of my face. Uh, what are your concerns as we go into what could be uh, uh, an event in Baghdad? What concerns you the most as this, you know, comes closer and closer? Yeah, I, I think, you know, for people to remain patient. Um, what the command is trying to do is to fight this the right way. And the right way is low military casualties on our side, low civilian casualties Which on our side. Which has been astonishingly low. Miraculous. As, as, as much as we all are bothered and concerned by what we have seen, and these people have given the ultimate sacrifice uh, for us, uh, the numbers are low. And that is something, uh, on the other side, we're talking thousands of people who have been lost. Correct? Yeah. Very true. I mean, 4,000 that are now in POW camps, and God knows how many who have died. Um, and, and that's the right approach, and it's a patient approach, and it's the right thing to do. And we're starting to see now, particularly from some of the journalists who are questioning the air marshal, a sort of a, a cynicism is starting to work its way in, and impatience. Be patient. They're doing about it the right way, and stay with it. Lieutenant Colonel Brian Hay, great to have you here on the set with us. And uh, thanks to all of our military guests tonight. We've really had a, a great parade of them tonight. We have uh, d almost all colonels. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> you know. Army and Air Force. And uh, our thanks to, to all of you for being in here tonight. And our thanks to those of you who are staying up late uh, on the East Coast. But remember, it's prime time out in, on the West Coast. And our coverage is not nearly complete. We are 24 7 these days. And uh, coming up next, we've got uh, Rick Fulbaum and Donna Fiducia who are going to be taking over the, the, uh, the set here. In fact, we've got to let them come up and get ready. So, uh, there's some night. images of, uh, of uh, what's going on in Iraq uh, to leave you with as we leave. Uh, leave you.
U.S. Here are the latest developments in Operation Iraqi Freedom. The commander of the British troops in Iraq says his forces destroyed a column of about 20 vehicles that left Basra to try to attack his troops. Air Marshal Brian Burridge says the attempted attack followed fierce fighting in the southern Iraqi city. He said loyalist Iraqi forces were threatening regular army troops that were trying to desert. The Pentagon says coalition troops are making remarkable progress. Sandstorms are not. Actually, the weather is clearing today, and allied officials say troops have moved more than 200 miles inside Iraq. They are closing in this hour on Baghdad. And President Bush has been meeting at Camp David with British Prime Minister Tony Blair, the two leaders, talking, of course, about the war now one week old. Earlier Wednesday, the president rallied the troops at MacDill Air Force Base in Florida. Good morning, everybody. It's 11 a.m. in Baghdad, 3 o'clock in the morning here in our New York studios, midnight out west. I'm Rick Fulbaum. And I'm Donna Fiducia. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. This is a Fox News Channel's course nonstop coverage of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And, uh, Rick, so much going on, even in the wee hours of the morning. We just saw uh, a U.K. CENTCOM uh, press briefing. Yep. And a, a kind of a tongue lashing to Al Jazeera television uh, from from the UK commander there talking. Yeah, well, about they're not very happy about some pictures that have been aired on uh, Al Jazeera, and the British are not the first people to be upset with Al Jazeera. The American officials have had some qualms with them as well. Of course, uh, the pictures had to do with some British soldiers that have been uh, captured and evidently killed. Two of them who had been missing. It turns out that apparently the pictures that were shown on Al Jazeera were the pictures of those two British soldiers and uh, British military officials obviously very upset about it. But there is a lot going on now. Iraqi defense spokespeople say that two cruise missiles struck a residential area of Baghdad in a coalition air raid on a heavily populated area. Steve Harrigan is monitoring that situation. He joins us live from Rawesha, Jordan with more. Steve. Rick, the reaction quite strong here in Jordan to those images, images of destruction in downtown Baghdad in a market area. Iraqi officials now saying 17 people killed in those midday explosions, 45 wounded. What's not clear at this point is who is responsible for those blasts. Iraqi officials placing the blame squarely on the U.S. They say the U.S. deliberately fired two cruise missiles into that market area. U.S. military officials, on the other hand, say that Iraq had surface-to-surface -surface missiles placed yards from residential homes in that area that were being targeted. U.S. officials also uh, don't rule out the possibility of an Iraqi uh, missile uh, falling back to earth and creating that explosion. In the meantime, in this part of the world, the reaction to it is quite clear and quite strong. Front page pictures here showing the chaos, showing Iraqi children walking through that chaos. Really, the blame is being placed on the U.S. here, whether that strike was a mistake or intentional. Certainly, the propaganda value is strong in this part of the world. And finally, British Prime Minister Tony Blair is expressing outrage of his own over some video. This videotape filmed by Iraqi television and then passed on to Al Jazeera, shown throughout the world. Video of, purportedly of two killed British soldiers, soldiers that went missing Sunday near the town of Basra. The video footage is very graphic. It shows the two bodies on a dirt road, spread eagle being shifted by a foot. Uh, British Prime Minister Blair expressing his outrage. This is the fourth time since the conflict began that Iraqi television has shown pictures of either killed or captured uh, coalition forces. Coalition officials, of course, say this is a violation of the Geneva Convention. Rick, back to you. Hey, Steve, you know, you're there in the, in the middle of the Arab world. Can you give us a sense of, you know, how this war is playing out there uh, and, and what people in Jordan and in, in other Muslim countries uh, think about what's happening so far? Rick, at least here, I'm struck by the Gulf. On the one hand, watching Western cable news channels downstairs and then talking to people who actually live here, there are two radically different pictures of this war. And if you talk to Arabs on the street here, there is a sense, uh, a sense echoed in the newspapers and the TV about the resistance, praising the resistance, even calling it heroic at some points. And we've also heard reports from Jordanian officials about 4,000 Iraqis going back into Iraq to fight. So there's a real sense here that Iraq is doing better than expected, uh, a sense of pride in Iraq's resistance so far, and even on the part of some at least boasting, perhaps, but, but saying they're going back into Iraq to help the fight. Rick? 
Steve Harrigan and Jordan, Rawesha Jordan. Steve, thank you very much. Let's talk now about the latest military strategy, Operation Iraqi Freedom, one week old. Joining us in our studios here, Colonel David Hunt, Captain David Christian, both Fox News military analysts, and joining us from Washington is Wayne Simmons, a former CIA operative. Nice to talk with all of you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Good morning. Let me start with you, Captain Christian, because the big story now has to do, uh, one of the things we're going to be hearing about over the next uh, few hours and the next day or so, has to do with uh, these Army paratroopers, uh, the 173rd Brigade, I think they are, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that have landed now in northern Iraq, opening up a whole new front here. What does it mean, big picture-wise? Big picture-wise, we, we uh, now have cut off the back door for uh, Baghdad in terms of uh, escape. We've had the Kurds uh, with our special ops uh, moving down, but now we have the, uh, the 173rd. I had a call from a father whose son uh, joined the unit, uh, and uh, they, they deployed out of Aviano, Italy, and uh, they've, they've been ready to go. They've been ready to go for the last six weeks, and uh, this is, is very exciting for them. However, I don't think they would be there if the 4th Infantry would have been allowed to go through Turkey. So what this shows is that the United States military has contingencies. We can move on a dime and we can bring something else in. Field commanders always like more field people in the field. Um, we could use some more also, I think, in the north there. Flexibility, Colonel Hunt. This, does this make some problems for Iraqi command and control, what's left of them? Oh, absolutely. It also, absolutely. It, 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 they've got to look now four, four, four or five different ways. Uh, it also shows, again, how much, how much improved um, it, it always has been, the reputation of our intelligence community. I mean, they've been vilified after 9-11. You don't do an airborne operation without pressing intelligence. You don't throw guys out airplanes without know what's going on on the ground. And we've done some amazing things with intel um, and, and producing very successful operations. But putting these guys up there with a two-mile airstrip is really going to cause Hussein's military problem. We're looking at live pictures of the 3rd Infantry Division. This is uh, in southern Iraq. Uh, talk of both of you, if you could, about the situation from the south and word that there are uh, convoys of Iraqi troops actually heading in that direction. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a very bad day. <laughs> it they makes do no that. sense, though, well, really, they, they, uh, they, they, They're sitting so, ducks. It was a good move for them, I guess, if, uh, if they had sandstorms. Mm -hmm. And but now it's cleared up. If they come, if they if they breathe wrong. I mean, the, the entire air force gets five or six carriers out there, full of plus the thir plus the third infantry division is exceptional. I mean, this is a this is a um, a turkey shoot if they do this. It's, it, it makes no sense tactically at all. Plus, we, we have about 300 uh, Apache uh, oh. helicopters, and the road they're taking, if I'm correct, is Route 80, and it's an elevated road. And uh, off to the sides is very marshy, and they keep calling it the swamp. They're going to push us into the swamp. Uh, we've been going the desert route so far, but if, if they're up on the hill, we're going to blow them into the swamp. Uh, if they're taking Route 80 and it's the elevated road, all the aircraft that uh, Colonel Hunt mentioned and the aircraft that uh, the helicopters that the Army have, uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force, and Marines, helicopters, and, and planes are going to take them out. We want to go to uh, Washington, where uh, Wayne Simmons, former CIA operative, is in our Washington studios. And uh, Wayne, if I could ask you your take on this from your perspective as a former CIA operative. Well, there's nothing more gratifying, I can assure you, than to watch the great men and women of our armed forces succeed because of uh, the intelligence that is provided by not only the CIA, but of course our special ops guys that are hitting the ground. So uh, it, again, this all stems from uh, directly from the top, from uh, finally having a wartime president in uh, President Bush and uh, a great intelligence pro uh, like Director Tenet and watching these unbelievable uh, men and women of, uh, of the intelligence community uh, provide this uh, intel that allows these uh, maneuvers to be successful. Wayne Simmons, let me ask you about intelligence for a moment and, and how, how much more intelligence we have in this fight, in this battle, as opposed to the war that was fought in Afghanistan? Well, <clears throat> I certainly couldn't compare, compare the two uh, because I'm not... Uh, uh, what I can tell you is this. From the moment September 11th happened, we hit the ground, meaning deep cover intelligence operatives. Uh, and I make the distinction there because the deep cover intelligence operatives provided by the CIA, we went in and rec recruited, we had our own guys on the ground. We are the ones who provided the intel to our 
other special ops, the Delta uh, uh, Rangers, uh, the SEALs, we're the ones who provided that intel to them to make sure that they got in safely and uh, were able to pull off their maneuvers. Well, they got away from being white glove intelligence also under under Bill Clinton and, and uh, that, Sen Senator Torricelli there, and I'm sure sure uh, Wayne would, would attest to the fact we got we 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 had uh, directives white glove? we had directives put out that we could not use intelligence uh, operatives as colleagues in the field. If there was any question mark behind their name, if they they came from a country that had uh, civil rights violations, if they had uh, human rights, particularly. So it's almost like you have to deal pol in <coughs> political well, correctness, we, but we you're did. really dealing with a our war hands were our, our hands were tied by Senator Torricelli in the intelligence community, and, and I'd really like Wayne to comment on that because it, well, that's a, that, that's exactly right, and uh, and I must tell you, <coughs> again, referring back to uh, to President Bush, he has taken the handcuffs off of us. He has said, get the job done. Director Tenet has said, get the job done. And uh, it's clear to these, uh, to the, uh, the gentleman sitting on the, on the, uh, in the seats with you, Rick, um, that's what's happening. We are successful. This is an incredible military op uh, operation in spite of what some of them in the press are saying. So listen, you don't go fishing for a great white shark with eight pound test and a jitterbug. You go out and you secure the very best uh, intel that you can, and that comes from very, very seedy places. Well, I'm not into fishing, but I think I get the gist of what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne Simmons, former CIA operative, thank you so much for joining us from our Washington studios. Thank We're going to uh, now go to uh, the latest from the region directly. David Lee Miller is standing by at the Central Command headquarters in Doha, Qatar. David, what's the latest from your point of view? David, can you hear me? Go ahead, Good David. morning. I think we have a little communication problem here. Okay. I hear a lot of, lot of voices, but uh, let me tell you what happened this morning here at CENCOM. A briefing was held by Brian Burridge. He is the air marshal in charge of the uh, British military effort, uh, the British uh, Tommy Franks, if you will. It was the first time that we heard from him, and much was made of what is now unfolding in Basra. That's a city of 1.3 million Iraqis. It is the second largest city in Iraq, and uh, according to the air marshal, paramilitary units are still in that city along with special security services of the regime and he says essentially what is unfolding now is that the uh, elite units these paramilitary units as well of Saddam Hussein are intimidating the regular army and the rest of the population there to take part in the ongoing resistance against the allies and he said that uh, there will be efforts to liberate Basra, and they will continue as long as it takes. His words now. He also underscored that uh, a 20-vehicle convoy was destroyed, Iraqi convoy, as it tried to leave Basra, and that is a city that is effectively surrounded by the uh, British forces. And uh, during the news briefing, Air Marshal Burridge made a point of saying that the um, British forces have unique experience in this type of uh, urban combat based on what happened in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And he also said that they are really not surprised by the resistance they are meeting in Basra. Let's listen to uh, what he had to say. We knew with regime paramilitaries. Our force was therefore designed with this in mind. The UK have developed highly effective and experienced infantry and Royal Marines who are expert in this type of operation. The regime paramilitaries are beginning to realize the level of our expertise. In Azubaya, members of, the, uh, of one division took swift and crucial action in the early hours of 26th of March against these forces, killing around 20 personnel and in a separate action, they captured a senior Bath Party paramilitary official. Now, in addition to capturing that senior Bath Party official, some 20 uh, others, his bodyguards, we are told, were killed. As to uh, what, if any, information they have been able to learn from that Bath Party official, he simply did not elaborate. Now, he also said that as for military actions, for the most part, the Alpha 
peninsula has been secured. The port of uh, Umm Qasar is for the most part secure, but he did say that uh, they did find two additional mines outside the area that had already been swept. And because of that concern, efforts to bring humanitarian help into Iraq through that port are being slowed down. A significant amount of food and medical supplies are now waiting to be delivered. And uh, a major point made this morning, Donna, during the news conference uh, dealt with the broadcast of the uh, two dead British soldiers on the Al Jazeera Arab language satellite station. That's a station that is based here in Qatar. It has uh, broadcast uh, some gruesome photographs of two dead soldiers. They were missing as of Sunday, and it now appears that they were killed by Iraqi forces. He wasted no time during the news conference, the air marshal, to say that he was outraged by what has been put on the air. I'd like to start by addressing the shocking close-up pictures broadcast by Al Jazeera last night. They claim that these show UK personnel killed during recent operations. Quite apart from the obvious distress that such pictures could cause friends and families of the personnel concerned, such disgraceful behaviour is a flagrant breach of the Geneva Convention. After the uh, statement from the uh, air marshal, when he took questions, the very first person to stand up was the correspondent for the Al Jazeera satellite channel, but uh, he did not uh, have a question for the air marshal. He rather made a statement, highly unusual, and he simply attempted to justify the broadcast that Al Jazeera made, saying that uh, they simply wanted to show the truth. The air marshal was not impressed, repeating again that he found those uh, images uh, offensive and unacceptable. Also during the uh, news conference, uh, the uh, air marshal uh, made a point of saying that earlier reports about an elite Republican Guard unit making its way from Baghdad to the south in the direction of U.S. Marines was an incorrect report. He said that uh, as best he knew, there were no major movements of the Republican Guard. And finally, he said that uh, he expects oil exports from Iraq using wells in the south to be possible in as uh, soon as uh, three months from now. Not clear, though, and this came out in one of the follow-up questions, Donna, was whether or not the uh, war itself would be over in 90 days. That's the latest from CENTCOM in Doha. Back to you. All right. Thank you so much, David Lee Miller. And a week now into Operation Iraqi Freedom, a new front opens in the north when we return a closer look at the operations from inside the Pentagon. Stay with the Fox News Channel. which is the stateside home to Central Command. Nice. Tommy Franks is usually there when he's not in Qatar. Kelly Wright is standing by at the Pentagon with more on everything that's going on. Good morning, Kelly. 
Uh, good morning to you, Rick. You know, here at the Pentagon, a, a lot of the officials have stated, the defense officials have stated that the latest information coming from CENTCOM is actually very promising. Uh, of course, we heard the uh, uh, Air Marshal Burrage describe what's going on. He painted a tapestry, if you will, of the war effort going on in, in Iraq. He described the ongoing battle in Basra, where a civilian uprising had been taking place there. And he described the Medellin or the Fedayeen and Ba'ath militia group as being very volatile.